Ford Mondeo presents Young Turks. Hello and welcome to Young Turks, the show that profiles young achievers. I'm Menika Doshi in Mumbai and joining me later on the show will be Shireen Bhan in Delhi. Hi Shireen, thanks so much Menika. I'm Shireen Bhan in New Delhi and the man I'll be meeting with today is responsible for getting Timex India to move ahead with the times. We meet a couple of people in a short while for the moment, it's right back to Menika. Well that's for later, right now we're about to meet a man who's 34 years old, looks much younger than his age and sounds much wiser than his years. Yash Billa, at the helm of Thousand Probably Been As A Fire, left an intensely spiritual and yet an inveterate socialite, a man of many moods, Yash Billa. Yash Birla was born with proverbial silver spoon, son of Ashok Birla and one of the key inheritors to the vast Birla empire. But a life that began easy soon turned into a baptism by fire. In 1990, when Yash was 22, his entire family, father, mother and older sister, died in a plane crash. Yash returned from an incomplete MBA course to take charge of a struggling group that included a clutch of businesses from steel pipes to carpets. Coping with sudden new responsibilities, even as he battled with personal grief, forced this young little Birla to grow up quickly. Well, according to me, life is a continuous process of learning in any case. So, they say like um, gold shines brighter when it passes through fire. I do believe that every day in your life you should be able to learn something. And learning for me has been uh, probably more because I've passed through several... Uh, I would say turmoils in my life. Okay, at 22, what kind of confidence do you need to come back, deal with loss like this and then take over a huge group with very diverse businesses and make a success out of it? If you look at it, it's, it's quite a raw age to be into business but we are part of a culture where a business is embedded in you from childhood. It's from a very young age, we start talking, we, we uh, start going to office for, uh, to just be with your father for a while you see him talking to several people in the meetings. So it's not that you're completely new to the culture. So for me, I was kind of uh, used to the, to the corporate background. But yes, it did come all of a sudden. Okay, so no self-confidence crisis when you came back and took charge of the group. Yeah, I guess in the beginning, you, you are young. You're younger than most people and probably the average age group at that time was above 45 in my group. So you did you know, feel that, oh, are they going to take you seriously? So there is a little bit of anxiety, but... Um, I guess your position gives you confidence as well. You know, you're at a particular position where you're put at the helm. So whether people appreciate it or not, whether they are skeptical or not, at the end of the day, they have to listen to you. You've been through a whole host of mentors. Some of them were family, aunts, uncles, uh, cousins. Some of them were family friends. Like I'm told Mr. Bajaj uh, was a good family friend of your father's. What was it like in that period? Uh, it did happen, doubts, trust, who can you trust, who can you not trust. Fortunately for me, everybody from my family to my uncles, to my friends, um, to my parents' friends like Mr. Bajaj you mentioned, they were so very helpful and so very supportive that um, it really gave me a lot of confidence from the support they showed to me. Okay, how difficult is it a legacy to live up to? It is an industrial empire and today sometimes you're also compared with Kumar Mangalam Birla, your cousin. Uh, are there comparisons that you hate? No, because I don't compare myself with anybody. So I don't, I've never really lived for what people talk or what people compare with or that I should live up to people because I have to live up to myself at the end of the day. In the past decade, Yash has carefully pruned the 16 group companies, bringing back focus and profitability. He's stuck to old businesses like pipes, even while expanding into lifestyle and consumer sectors. And all along, his mantra has been look at business unemotionally where just because you are with a business and you have to make it run don't just keep trying to make it run even though it's not capable of being run I'm still in a lot of diversified activities that's because of the legacy and those diversified activities as long as they're not a drain on my resources or on my opportunity cost if I may call it that way they're going on so you're supposed to be very different in, in the way you do your business than your father um, not, this is from your previous interviews also your father was far more a strategy-led person you're a much more hands-on person, yeah, is it? Yeah. But ultimately, I'll tell you something. I should get to where my father was. 
right? Yeah. You have to start off from hands-on levels, what I was doing, what I am doing till now, but I would like to get out of it and to get on to that level where, like my father, where he was only thinking about policies and strategies and what we should do in the future. If you were telling me that uh, you've put in a management board of sorts in place, yeah. that, that somewhere is allowing you to move towards that kind of structure. That's where, where I'm, I'm aiming to move towards that and that's the reason why I've done this. To achieve that long-term objective that day-to-day -day management should be done more by the executives and strategy and long-term management should be more done by, by the group leader. Did you ever emulate your father in the sense that draw upon your memories of him and how he used to manage things and try and no, copy that? Really. As far as my father and me were concerned, our personalities were, is, is very distinct. It was very rarely that I really tried to emulate him because uh, I looked up to him right. and probably I wanted <coughs> to follow some of his ideals. But you didn't necessarily never, copy yeah, him. Yeah, I didn't because I was quite... Uh, different from my childhood as a person, as an individual and I had very strong fixed views. What kind of strong fixed views? I mean, were they about life or morality or uh, things like that? About life, about morality. I was very, uh, I was in fact overly principled as a, as a child. I had very strong likes and dislikes. That this should be and this shouldn't be. In fact, my parents were much more flexible to lifestyles and things like that than me myself. So you must be an awfully strict father. I'm not strict that you sit and study, don't go out, don't do this, don't do that. So I'm not strict from that point of view. But what I am strict is about morals and principles. The sons follow their father's bent towards spirituality and self-determination. A leaning that started at an early age today dominates most of Yasha's personality. Gurus, meditation, pilgrimages, these are not just fancy words but an intrinsic part of his life, helping him cope with personal tragedy. But have you ever felt in your life that why me? Never. 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 But the one regret that you always had at that point at least and you've done something to remedy is it is that you didn't get to finish your studies. I couldn't finish my MBA. I said, oh, that's something I really regret that I can't study. So then I tried to do whatever I could in those circumstances. I did my M I had done my MCOM before I went for my MBA. Then I came back and I did law by correspondence. And I, through KC College, I, did, I attended a few lectures and the rest I did through correspondence. And I got the law degree. So it's still something I would have liked to study more. To be honest with you, yeah, I would have liked to study even more than that. Avanti, his wife of 11 years, has been through thick and thin with him. She not only spearheads some of the group's lifestyle businesses, but also shares Yash's passion for spiritualism and philosophy. We are both very spiritual. We, our spare time is spent with our kids or exercising, health and fitness, or in bhajan, satsang, meditation, or in traveling, sometimes for all day, sometimes for work and sometimes for pilgrimages. Are you a demanding husband? I was very demanding. I used to, uh, if I'm home at 7 o'clock, I would like her to be there before me. I would like her to uh, serve me food. I would like her to put out my office clothes. I was as demanding as that. You have to do this, you don't have to do this. You have to do this, you don't have to. But now I'm not. It's all comes with spir spiritual uh, progression. You stop learning to be demanding, you, st you be more satisfied with yourself. Okay, so we come to your sweet child, morally very, very upright, studious, and you're the page three delight nowadays uh, of society. Do you enjoy it? Is that a part of your personality that you like expressing? No, it's not that I like it or dislike it. It's just the part of my personality which people seem to pick up more than anything else. I don't like much to be in the, in the line that I'm a, I'm a very private person. I, as, I told, as you must have got from the conversation, I basically live for myself and for my own ideal. But let's say sometimes that side of me overshadows the real me because uh, page 3 is basically uh, more to do with style and lifestyle and things like that. And uh, it's, it, it, yes, it is me. I do enjoy, um, I do enjoy clothes, I, I like fashion, I like going out. But the real me is much more. A curious mix of business and bohemia, taboos and tattoos, depth and dapper, piety and prada. Yash Birla is quite the flower child of this century. 
Like I said, he's a man of many moods. Well, coming up right after this commercial break is Shireen with her personality of the week. So, don't go away. Young Turks presented by Ford Mondeo. Refined aggression. Ford Mondeo presents Young Turks. Welcome back to Young Turks. My guest today took on the daunting task of engineering a U-turn for Timex India after its corporate divorce from Titan. Meet the young, energetic managing director of Timex, Kapil Kapoor, whose aim is to make Timex a 21st century proposition. Watches make him tick. For Kapil Kapoor, MD of Timex India, watches are not just about telling time, they're an extension of one's personality. After stints with Nestle and Bosch and Lom, Kapil took over Timex in 2000, when the company was still reeling from its split with Titan. Two years later, the company is back on track and is on its way to breaking even next year. But what made him leave a cushy job overseas to take over a business in a slump? Life was uh, pretty much of a cruise. Uh, I was missing the adrenaline rush, and I guess that was probably uh, you know one of the reasons I made the change. It's uh, from a work point of view, I sort of missed out on uh, the work atmosphere in India, which uh, I'd rate uh, just about the way best in the world. Right, but uh, you know the corporate split between Titan and Timex had already happened when you took over. The business was not doing well. You were incurring pretty heavy losses. So did you have a mission statement in mind as to how you wanted to turn things around for the company? Just seeing this uh, from the outside, I saw the pains and the frustrations of uh, a brand that uh, could have been so many other things but wasn't being able to express itself. Uh, because of an erstwhile arrangement with uh, the joint venture partner and uh, Timex was, went in there as a lower end brand. Uh, seeing as I did what Timex was overseas and internationally, felt here was a brand that could achieve a lot more. But how much of business is really instinct and how much of it is something that you can be taught at a B school? I'd say the basic uh, skill sets, what you need to sort of work on and hone are very much a B school sort of uh, training that it sort of lends you that. However, uh, beyond that, it is really how you develop your personality, uh, as you were saying, you know, instincts, gut feel. But, uh, you know, it's a competitive world, it, it's a dog eat dog world there. So, what really are the qualities that you think that you have helped you survive? Uh, I think I, I learned from the school of hard knocks. I was sort of just thrown in into Bihar when I joined Nestle, my first job from campus and uh, while most of my friends were sitting in cushy air-conditioned offices and things, uh, I, I was given a first-class ticket to travel in, in Bihar by train and lo and behold I get into this train and I find uh, all the seats are taken. The ticket collector comes around and right from an 8-year-old to a 60-year-old everyone saying, hum vidyarthi hain. <laughs> and I realized that's, that's the way it works in Bihar, you know. So you learn to speak that lingo and you just learn to interact with people in a very different environment. You sort of unlearn everything you learned at, at the B school. Uh, which one is more challenging or has more pressure involved in it? Taking over successful business or taking over business which is in a slump? It's a question I've asked myself in my career, but uh, in the net I'd say what keeps me ticking is very clearly a business in a slump. Uh, the dramatic impact of a change, of a turnaround, is something that can't be replicated. The, it's, it's, it sort of runs through the whole organization, it's, it defines the new DNA of the organization and that, that's a great feeling. With Kapil at the helm, Timex has undergone an image change. From a low segment watch, the company is now looking at the middle and upper middle brand conscious go-getters. Adding a sporty touch to the brand is also part of the image change. Now Timex is all about style and substance, much like the man heading it. 
Now, a lot of people say that the communication part of it was a problem in the past. Do you think you've got the ingredients right now as far as your communication strategy is concerned? I guess the discovery, as, as you probably know, a brand is never really invented. It's discovered and, you know, you try and peel off a layer and discover new things every day. So I believe we've got the basic ingredients in place. We have been able to identify and position it essentially as a sports and technology brand. We're also discovering that this brand helps a lot of people around the world and around the country discover another side and express their other side, their lesser known side. And it's almost as though this is a passport to a club that you belong and you, you just flash your watch and you say, hey, you know, I live that kind of life too. What's your other side like? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. I, I, I'm a bit more boring person, I guess. But uh, no, I, you know, it's... You can uh, be honest. <laughs> you can be honest. <laughs> right. It's difficult saying this on television, but I guess just wanting to tell people that, hey, you know, this, this corporate stuff jacket role you may see me in is not me. I'd love to go out for a trek. I'd love to do all the other things, play golf, play cricket, be in you know, be a natural child when I see my cricket heroes. So are you the ideal time X-Men? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to grow into that role, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know what came first, whether I, the brand is trying to mirror me or I'm mirroring the brand, but it, it sort of uh, rubs off on each other, I guess. Right, now talking about your choice for your brand ambassador, Harsha Bogle, it has raised eyebrows because he doesn't quite have the glamour attached to an Eshwarya Rai, which is a brand ambassador for some of the other watch companies. Right. And neither does it have the sporting legend uh, associated with the likes of Sachin Tendulkar. Right. So why Harsha Bogle? Is it the IIM network which is doing the rounds? <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, uh, I was accused of that, but I'd, I'd really say it's, uh, you know, Harsha epitomizes everything this brand stands for because it goes beyond glamour. Harsha is an IAM grad, he could have made a very successful corporate career. He gave it up to follow his own passions, his heart, and discover what he was really good at. You talked about following your dreams. Are you following your dreams at this point? Is this I, what you wanted to do? You know, I, I, I wasn't sure, but having got there, I really think I'm having a ball of a time. You've decided to move out of the lower end segment, something which Timex was known for. You've moved out of the under 500 category altogether. Mm -hmm. Was that because of the competition from the unorganized sector, cheaper Chinese imports, all of that? I, I believe to crystallize a position in a consumer's mind, uh, the law of sacrifice is an important ingredient, which means you must forego certain sales that are non-profitable sales. So are you going to continue to focus on the 1,000 to 1,500 range and what about competition from the likes of Esprit and Swatch? Well, we've been handling this competition very successfully in many parts of the world and our thrust areas would be from 1,000 to 5,000 really. Mm -hmm. And uh, the advantage that we have, our USP if you will, is the fact that we are the only multinational in India with domestic manufacturing capability. I do believe at an operating level we will break even in this fiscal and uh, possibly take care of the non-operating lines uh, in the next fiscal. Home is a cozy picture. Wife Anjali and 11-year-old son Rohan make his life complete. And when he's not at work, he gives radio broadcasting and writing columns a shot. And just to talk about the, your personal side, apparently you were involved with radio broadcasting. Do you like to talk? I certainly do. I'm not sure everyone else around me enjoys that. But uh, yeah, I certainly did it. But radio broadcasting and uh, television has sort of undergone a major change. I'm not sure I'd be up to it today, though. Uh, what about writing? Uh, love notes to your wife or romantic poetry? Or what sort of form does that take? I suspect I've hit a writer's block there too and uh, if Shakespeare in love is anything to go by, I have to discover, you know, rediscover a love to figure that one out. And finally, what's the road ahead looking like for you? What's the next level of achievement that you're looking at? I don't kind of go that far out. I don't look out that far in the future for purely from business objectives point of view. I uh, have a very clearly defined goal which all of us uh, empathize with in the company which is be the number one brand in India. Uh, from a personal goal point of view, I possibly would end up teaching in some remote university and living the student life again because I just enjoy being with them. Well, that was Kapil Kapoor, the man who's quite literally turned the clock around for Timex. Time for us to head for a short break, but when we return, we'll be back with a set of 20 questions for both our achievers. So stay with us. Young Turks presented by Ford Mondeo, Refined Aggression.